I'm John Duvall. Welcome to the Scriptural Way Bible Study. The Scriptural Way Bible Study is brought to you by the Seminole Point Church of Christ, located at 16300 North May Avenue, Oklahoma City. On behalf of the elders and members of the Seminole Point Church of Christ, I would like to thank you for your interest in spiritual matters. Now, let's take our Bibles and seek the scriptural way. Good evening. This is the Scriptural Way broadcast, and I'm John Duvall. And I'm Dale Decker. And I'm John Hall. It is so wonderful to have you with us this evening for a time period of studying the Word of God, of seeking that Scriptural Way. Dale, how are you doing this evening? I'm doing wonderful. That's good. You know, one day you need to say, you know, John, I just learned that I've got to have my left ear amputated just to change things up, because you're always wonderful. Well, if I did say that, I would still be wonderful. Well, that's true. Because I truly believe that all Christians are wonderful. That's the way to look at it. That's the way to look at it. John, how are you doing? See if you can top that. Uh, well, even though I usually sit with my right side to the camera, I have not had my left ear <laughs> amputated. <laughs> but I'm doing pretty good. <laughs> uh, that is super. And we hope that you are doing well. Hope that everything in your life is going as is accordance to the will of the Lord. And we hope that you are seeking daily the scriptural way, a study pattern that plums, that just you jump right into the Word of God to see what it has to say. You know, far too often I encounter Bible studies with individuals, or Bible discussions, I should say, where very, very little do they ever open the Bible and talk book, chapter, and verse. It's always what they think, what they believe, what so-and-so has said. Truly, if you're going to seek the will of God, seek that scriptural way, you have to delve into his wonderful word. And so that is what we do here at Seminole Point Church of Christ, located in Oklahoma City. We seek the scriptural way to serve our Heavenly Father in all ways that are in accordance to his will. If you'd like to have more information about the Seminole Point Church of Christ, later after the broadcast, you'll see a link at the upper right-hand side of the, your viewing page there. And that link should take you to SeminolePoint.org. Org, and that will give you more information about this local congregation. Now, I want to tell you how you communicate with us tonight because no discussion that we have could be as good as they have been without you. We really appreciate your participation in our study. If, you have, if you'd like to jump in on the discussion, if you hear something that maybe you disagree with or you have a question regarding, then we invite you to click on the live chat link and they'll open up a chat window. If you have a Ustream account, you can sign in with that and it'll give you, let you use your username. If you don't, that, that is fine. It'll give you a generic uh, login name. And all we ask is that you tell us your first name and where you are from. That way John can keep track of the comments as they come through the chat room and the questions as well. Also, you can use the button to fill out the form if you want to do a submission form, if you'd like to do that, or use your email program to send the questions and comments to questions at seminolepointcofc.org. Well, gentlemen, we are in lesson number seven. We are. Of We're our just study about of the, to finish it up, too. We are. We're looking at the armor of God, as you saw in the opening title there. And we have just a little bit more in Lesson 7, and then after that, we'll step into our last lesson of this particular study. That'll be Lesson number 8. But I tell you what, here's what we're currently looking at in the last, um, just kind of go back a couple of points here within our lesson. We've been looking in our study of the sword of the Spirit. We were looking at what the Word does through the Spirit, or I should say what the Word does the Spirit does. And we pointed out that the Spirit is the one who produces a new birth, through the Word of God. And we took a few minutes to examine that. And then we talked last week about the Spirit sanctifying people by the Word of truth. And then, where we're going to be looking at tonight, Dale, is what? The Spirit leads people to become God's children. The Spirit leads people to become God's children. Yeah. I think that's a good subject. It is. And your first thought would be, well, there's direct intervention, but... Uh, Let's look at the, the scriptures and see exactly what the scriptures have to say about that. I was in a, I was in a short Bible study earlier today. It was actually a rather lengthy one, but I was there for a short time. And this kind of came up in, in the discussion a little bit. Did it? Um, and um, 
about how, how do we get the Holy Spirit and so forth. And we're not going to take time to go into all the details, but um, you can look at last week's broadcast to kind of get catch up to speed on what we were looking at regarding that. But let's talk about how does the Spirit lead people, Dale? Well, the Apostle Paul was talking to the church at Rome, and he looked at, uh, in, in Romans, the 8th chapter, verses 14 through 17, he says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For if you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. But now we have to ask the question, though, how does the Spirit do this? Well, that's, that's true. As, as you read at the first part of the verse, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God. That's right. How does the Spirit do this? Good question. And we have to go back to what Paul said to the church at Rome in Romans, the first chapter then. Okay. Verses 16 17, he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. All right. So Paul there acknowledges in relation to the gospel of Christ, it being the power of God to salvation, and in it is revealed the righteousness of God. That is in, correct. Within that gospel. That is correct. Okay. But then we go to Romans, the sixth chapter, okay. and we look at verses 17 and 18. And Paul here says, But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. So, what we see there, and Paul's continuing in his letter there to the saints in Rome there, he, he, he reminds them that at one time they were slaves of sin, but yet they obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine, All right, which is the gospel, which is that word of God. And so in this case in point, the way the Spirit led these people to God was by the inspiration of the word, giving it to the apostles. The apostles then taught it to the people, and the people then obeyed it from the heart. And, and we have the written, wor inspired word of God today. Exactly. If you want to be led by the Holy Spirit, read your Bible. Exactly right. Because you, know, you think about John 14, 26. Jesus told his apostles that he would send to them the comfort of the Holy Spirit, who would teach them all things and bring into the remembrance all things that Christ had taught. Well, that happened on the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit's job was to bring the word to the apostles um, to use miraculous gifts to confirm the word, and the Holy Spirit fulfilled both those tasks wonderfully. People during the first century could perform miracles, would have gifts of knowledge, gifts of, uh, of, of uh, speaking in tongues, gifts of interpretation, all of these to confirm the word, but part of it was to enable the, the, the initial teaching of the word and establishing it, and we have it for us today. That's exactly right. So the question is, why do people limit the work of the Holy Spirit by denying that he can accomplish his work by using his sword, namely the Word of God? That's a good question. I think what we look at, and we, don't, we won't take the time to go into this detail, but I think the idea of the Holy Spirit controlling our lives, it stems back to Calvinism, back to Augustine, um, not too many years after the church was established. The, the idea that, basically it goes back to the idea that man can do, a sinful man, man who's not yet a Christian, can do nothing righteous of his own accord. That's what Augustine believed. Our, our nature was fully corrupted to the very core. And I had this one fellow tell me that no matter how much you study the Bible, one who's not saved will not come to a knowledge of what they must do. A person cannot study their way into becoming a child of God. You know, the Holy Spirit must move them. And they must be chosen by God in order for that to be done. Well, the idea of the Holy Spirit taking control of our lives and leading us in a miraculous intervention type way is part of that. It's not all of it, but it comes from that doctrine. Yeah. Um, but when you study the scriptures, you find that the Holy Spirit's work was a wonderful work, and we have the result of it in our written word. Well, that's true, and we do have to accept the fact that the Holy Spirit is active today, leading people yeah. to be born again. That's right. Uh, leading people to a sanctified life and leading people to become God's children. But we must understand that there is no direct indwelling of the Holy Spirit. To believe this would be to deny the Apostle Paul's statement to put on the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Yeah. 
And everything that we have said in this lesson points to the fact that it is the indirect indwelling through the Word of God that the Spirit does His work. That's right. When you think about it, the more the Word dwells in you, the more the Spirit dwells in you. If you, you know, if you let the Word guide your life, you're letting the Spirit guide your life. If you weigh every decision that you have to make by what the Bible teaches, then you're weighing your decision by the Holy Spirit. It's through that, the Word. That's correct. You know, and this we don't have time for this discussion tonight, but I, in my study, I've come to understand the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the same as the indwelling of God and the indwelling of Christ. Because the Bible teaches all three dwell within us. And the Bible teaches that we dwell within them. So to me, the singular word that, that helps me to understand how this all takes place is fellowship. When we're living faithful unto God, when we're added to that body of Christ, we are in fellowship with the Father, with the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And as long as we are led by that Word of God, then we are being led by the Holy Spirit. And I think that's, and that is God's, that is the way that we use the sword of the Spirit. That's taught Which to us is by God. the Word of God. Exactly. And I realize a lot of people would disagree with that. Maybe not many people who's listening currently, but there are many in the world who would. You know, and my, my encouragement would be, let's don't get, don't get so caught up on whether or not the Holy Spirit dwells within someone. Let's go to the Word which was given to us by the Holy Spirit and spend a lot of time in that and then see where you come out, you know. I think that one of the things that people are, are missing is what you were just describing, that connection. Mm -hmm. When we talk about being led by the Holy Spirit, they, they don't think to look at at the connection between the Word of God, the Apostles, the Holy Spirit, Jesus yeah. Christ. They don't look at that relationship that it, you know, started with Jesus yeah. or even with God. Uh, sending Jesus, then sending the Holy Spirit, who then inspired you know, the Apostles to write the proper words that were needed as they were inspired to, as they were told to do by right. Jesus. It, it, if you have someone, uh, let's say a leader of a company, who, who speaks words, but yet he has someone who does dictation for him, Mm -hmm. and types it into a letter and then drafts that letter into a policy for the company and sends it out to everybody. If everybody what would everybody think about that letter? Did the person who wrote that letter dictate it? Is that the person who is leading them? No. It's the leader. Yeah. But the leader didn't actually type it. The leader didn't even actually, you know, maybe didn't even maybe there was somebody else who was speaking what the leader wanted him to speak. We can yes. we can understand this concept is what I'm saying in physical terms, but for some reason when it comes to the spiritual concept, we all of a yeah. sudden just can't seem to link that, that stepping process between one who might, who, who might have told someone or inspired someone to do something, then writing it down, and then having it recorded for us, and then we understand that we're not led by the one who wrote it, we're led by the one <clears throat> who inspired the one who wrote it. Right. That's right. Well, you know, one of the, the big passages that oftentimes is used in this is Acts 2, verse 38 where Peter said, Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And oftentimes that's read as, here's the Holy Spirit, I'm giving it to you, the gift of the Holy Spirit. And when I've looked at that, I don't view it so much as the gift of the Holy Spirit, but a gift from. All right. So what was that gift from the Holy Spirit? Well, I believe it's the promise of salvation. He gave it to Joel, and Joel conveyed it in prophecy, Jesus brought it to the earth, and uh, Joel was led by the Holy Spirit. David was led by the Holy Spirit, all these to speak of the great promises that was to come. And then, and you think about it, and he says, and the promise of salvation is to you and to your children and to all who are far off. So I think a good explanation of the gift of the Holy Spirit would be that promise of salvation, a gift given from the Holy Spirit in the Word there. Anyway, it's just, again, a lot of different thoughts on that, just something else for you to consider tonight. So... Well, I'll tell you what let's do. We, we are going to have three breaks tonight. We've got a new minute message for later on this evening. So what we'll do is we're going to go ahead and take our first break. Get that in right now. Dale, you know we need to re-record a few of these. We have some changes in the leadership of the congregation, and we need to you know, take some time to record some of these new ad spots, if you would. We do. So just remind me to do that. Just say, John, remember. John, remember to do that, will you? I'll try. Um, <laughs> anyway, on the other side of the break, we're going to jump into Lesson 8. 
God's power to withstand evil. So if you haven't downloaded Lesson 8, please take this opportunity to do so. You can download it and view it in a PDF format. For those who are listening on the audio-only channel, there's a possibility I did not put the link in there. But if you want to open it in another browser, the download uh, lesson page, you'll see a copy of it there. All righty, stay tuned. And on the other side of the break, we'll jump into that discussion. We'll be right back. Hello, I'm Ron Witt, one of the elders of the Seminole Point Church of Christ. On behalf of the elders and members of the Seminole Point Church of Christ, I would like to invite you to be our guest at any of our worship services and Bible classes. The meeting place of the Seminole Point Church of Christ is located at 16300 North May Avenue, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, zip code 73. 013. The Seminole Point Church of Christ meets Sunday mornings at 9.30 for Bible classes, 10.30 for worship service, and 5 p.m. for our afternoon worship service. We also have Bible classes on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. In addition to our regularly scheduled Bible classes and worship services, we also have a Bible class on Tuesday morning at 10 this live netcast at 7.30 p.m., and a ladies' Bible class which meets once a month. Whether you live in Oklahoma City area or you are traveling through Oklahoma City, we would love to have you come and be our guest. We have Bible classes for all ages. Now, let us return to our study. Let's see. We need to step into lesson number eight. We have a question that's come up in the chat room, and um, I'm going to ask uh, Rosalito from the Philippines. He's the one, I think, that has submitted that question. And for a little bit of clarity here, and then um, and John's going to follow up with him on that, and then we'll come back. I want to make sure we understand the question before we actually discuss the question. Mm -hmm. don't want to misunderstand it, though. So... Um, Reread that, Rosalito, and, and see if there's something left out that might help us to understand it a little bit better there. So, so let's go ahead and step into lesson number eight, and then we'll step back to that um, here in just a few minutes there. Dale, this one is entitled, God's Power to Withstand Evil. And I think probably the best thing to do to really get into this lesson is to take a minute and read Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. Well, I, I agree with you. And the whole purpose of the lesson, one could say we could have used this lesson at the very beginning of it. But it's kind of yeah. a summation of everything that Paul has talked about up to this point. Because if you look at what he said here when he wrote to the church at, at uh, Ephesus uh, in chapter 6, beginning with verse 10, he said, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh, flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wicked, wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the, in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with, prepara with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. So the idea is that Paul is encouraging God's people to fight the good fight. And for that reason... We need to fully understand what he's saying here in Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 18. Okay. And accept the fact that uh, God has provided the armor for us. Right. Uh, it's up to us to put it on and use it. Okay. Well, let's ask a question then. How would you identify or to what would you compare Christianity? Let's well, look that, at that for a minute. That's a good question. And, and uh, when you look at the parables that Jesus spoke, often he used this statement, the kingdom of heaven is like, or likened unto. Okay. Paul compared the Christian life to an athletic contest. In fact, if you go to the letter that he wrote to the uh, church at Corinth in 1 
1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. He said, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run? But one receives the prize, run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is tempered in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus not with uncertainty. Thus I fight not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subject, subjection, lest when I have preached to the others, I myself should become disqualified. Uh, you think about that. Uh, today we're very familiar with contests, uh, sporting events, races, mm -hmm. uh, and we have to remember the individual who comes in second is the first loser. That's the truth. That's true. And this is why the Apostle Paul said, fight the good fight. Make sure that you're fighting it to win. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what he told the church at Ephesus in Ephesians, the sixth chapter. He's not trying to say there's a competition among God's children. He's saying you as an individual, you work as if there's only one prize. Exactly yeah. right. And, and, and we all should strive for it. Exactly. And we all, if we do as God says, we all will be first, not that's second. Right. That's right. The same fervor, the same zeal as if you were, a, you know, only one person who's going to win is the way we run. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Paul often compared mm -hmm. the Christian life to warfare. Uh, well, he did. The Christians he did. are compared to soldiers. There in Second Timothy chapter two, verse three and four, Paul tells Timothy, "You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ." <coughs> no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. It's easy for you to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true, though. That's you know, this, this Thursday is Veterans Day. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I'm thankful, and, and I know we have some of our audience who may have been Vietnam veterans. Uh, our country was very uh, disenchanted uh, with the uh, Vietnam War. And mm -hmm. the soldiers who fought that war were mistreated uh, by our country uh, severely in the sense that they were shown disrespect. But today, the soldier is given a lot of respect. And there are many restaurants, there are many stores that automatically give discounts to uh, American soldiers that have served. And it doesn't matter whether they served two years or whether they served 30 years. There's a lot of respect for the soldier. And there's a reason being is because we recognize that soldiers often endure great privations. Uh, yeah. They're taken from their homes, their families, their friends. They, they're exposed to cold, mm -hmm. uh, to heat. People may not realize it, but our soldiers that are in the Middle East right now, in Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, you're looking in the summertime, temperatures that reach 120, 130 degrees, and they're carrying around 150 pounds on their back oftentimes uh, in that heat. And we complain because it's 100 degrees here in, in the United States. And so we need to understand the extreme temperatures, the, the conditions that these folks are in. Mm -hmm. They're on fatiguing marches. They're sustained on, on course fare or almost destitute of food. Uh, they are often compelled to endure as much as the human frame can bear and often indeed sink under their burdens and die. If for reward or their country's sake they are willing to do this, the soldier of the cross should be willing to do it for our Savior's sake. You know, that's true. That's true. You know, it would, be, um, it would be foolhardy for an individual to seek Christianity or to expect Christianity to be a, a place of ease, if you would. You know, it's, it's not, you know, there's a lot of joy from the knowledge of having had our past sins washed away, but it's not like we've just jumped onto a cruise and the rest of our life is going to be smooth sailing. Well, that's very true. No one should come to, into Christianity merely to enjoy himself. Yeah. Uh, and no one should enter uh, it that is not prepared to lead a soldier's life and to welcome hardship and trial as his portion uh, because that individual would make a very bad soldier. And that's true. Uh, who at his enlistment should make it a condition that he should be permitted to sleep on a bed of down and always be well clothed and fed and never exposed to peril or compelled to pursue a wearisome march. Yet some men enter Christianity making these the conditions. That's true. We shouldn't be surprised if we, ended up go if we end up going through challenges within our life and difficulties. Look at the apostles. Look at Stephen. 
Um, look at others who lost their lives, who lost their homes in the first century. We shouldn't think it's strange that we too would suffer. But I wonder sometimes, y'all, I wonder if this is, this is why we have to be very thorough when we convert someone, when we teach somebody. Because let's say for the sake of argument that you attend a congregation of three or 400 people and everybody's close. Young people are always getting together. There's just a lot of, of, of zeal there. And so you bring someone in who's maybe missing a lot of family life. Maybe they've got problems and challenges, and, and, and they love the environment. You teach them about the gospel. They're enthusiastic about it, and they say, I want to be baptized into Jesus Christ. So you, based on their stated repentance and belief in Jesus, you baptize them into Christ. And then for the next two or three years, they're at this wonderful congregation, and everything's going fine. But then they have to move. And they, the, the, where they're moving to, the only congregation, some small little congregation composed mostly of older people of maybe 25, and the singing's not as good to the ears, and the, the preacher tends to fall asleep during the sermon himself, and you just there's no young people to hang out with. Um, it's possible that we might sometimes, and it's not our intention that we try not to, but it may be possible to convert someone not to Christ, but to the Christianity, to the whole field of everything, of closeness and fellowship, and, and or I should say our relationship with one another. And then all of a sudden, when that's taken away because it's a physical outward thing, they tend to fall away because it, it, it's, they're expecting everything, all their problems to be solved. And the only problem that is solved when you become a Christian is a sin problem, is the guilt of your past sins. You know, now you're reconciled with Christ. It doesn't mean that everything else after that is not difficult or, or won't necessarily be difficult. Um, it was just kind of a thought. Kevin pointed out there in 1 Peter 4, verse 12, what Peter said, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Yep. Don't need to think it's strange. Yeah. You know, you go back to what the Apostle Paul said when he was talking to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, that we read just a moment ago. When he says, you therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. But notice verse 4. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life. Now, when you think about that, the idea is that neither the minister nor the soldier is to be encumbered with the affairs of this life. This is always a condition in becoming a soldier. A soldier gives up his own business during the time for which he is enlisted, and he devotes himself to the service of his country. A farmer will leave his plow, and the mechanic his shop, and the merchant his store, and the student his books, and the lawyer his brief, and neither of them expect to pursue these things while engaged in the service of their country. Yeah. So it would be wholly impractic impracticable to carry on the plans of a campaign if each one of these classes should undertake to prosecute his private business. One Roman soldiers were not allowed to marry mm -hmm. or to engage in any husbandry or trade, and they were forbidden to act as tutors to any person or curators, uh, curators to any man's estate or proctors in the cause of other men. Hmm. Uh, the general principle was that they were excluded from those relations, agencies, and engagements which it was thought would divert their minds from that which was to be the sole object of pursuit. Right. So the important point then that Paul is making here with Christians of the gospel, he will accomplish the design of his apartment only when he can say in sincerity that he is not entangled with the affairs of this life. I think that's a good point. You know, because you imagine having a soldier who just got a Dear John letter. You know, he's just learned that his wife is leaving him. You know, now here he is on the battlefield. I mean, truly, if the soldier had no outside cares or concerns, he wouldn't have anything to weigh him down like that. You know, and so that's, that's a very interesting point there with that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Kevin, we've got a thought in the chat room. Anthony made a couple of good points there. He's uh, looked at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, where uh, Paul says, All that will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Mm -hmm. you know, and back in verse 10 and 11, he talks about how they were follow carefully following him and right. his persecutions and afflictions and all those things that happened to him. And then he goes on to say, And all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer these types of things. Yeah, uh, I think that's a very good point. And then he mentioned there at the end, uh, woe unto you when all men speak evil or speak well of you, uh, not evil, <laughs> when they speak well of you. And then he says, you know, if we aren't suffering some form of hardship, we're probably not walking in the light. I think that's a good point. Yeah. If 
everything in life, especially in the physical world, our jobs and you know our neighbors and everybody we come into contact with, if it's always wonderful, it, not saying necessarily something's wrong, but it may be worth a good look. Yeah, that's an interesting thought. That's a, actually a very good point there with that. Um, one of the last things to notice about the verse there that we're looking at, he goes on to say that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. Now you think about this for a moment. The soldier's great object is to approve himself to the one who enlisted him. He wants to seek his approval there. And it is not to pursue his own plans or to have his own will or even to accumulate property or fame for himself. His will is absorbed in the will of his commander. So nowhere else is, is it so true that the will of one becomes lost in that of another, as in the case of the soldier. So in an army, it is contemplated there that there shall be but one mind, one heart, one purpose, that of the commander, and that the whole army shall be as obedient to the commander as the members of the human body are to the one that wills control over them. And the application of this is pretty obvious. The grand purpose of the Christian is to please Jesus Christ, our great commander. He is to pursue no separate plans or to have no separate will of his own, and it is contemplated that the whole core of Christians shall be as entirely subordinated to the will of Christ as an army is to the orders of his chief. You know, and that's, that's our attitude towards our responsibility as soldiers of Christ. Mm -hmm. so. Well, and, or should be. Should be. That's yeah. true. And, and that's, that's, the, true. That's, the, that's the whole purpose of these studies is for people to not just hear a bunch of words, but to hear it and go, let me ask myself that question. Yeah. Is that describe me? Am I falling short? Right. That's, that's true. Yeah. And, we, and we looked at two different verses here in 1 Corinthians about the running, running the race and fighting and 2 Timothy about the, the, the warfare, the, the, the soldier. Mm -hmm. And then over in 2 Timothy again in verse 4, 7, he really wraps both of them together when he says, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. So yeah. if, if you take fought the good fight you know, as a soldier rather than fighting and beating the air, I guess. But <laughs> that's, a, that's a good point. I noticed that Rosalito put in there that from, in quoting First Peter, First Peter 4.19, Therefore let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls in well-doing as to a faithful creator. You know, and truly, as Anthony says, would that all Christians would realize this and understand it. Well, we need to go ahead and take our next break. On the other side of the break, let's take just a few minutes, and we'll back up and look at the, the question that Brother Rosalito had. Got a little bit of clarity on it, I think. So we'll kind of talk about that briefly, and then we'll continue with our, our study. So appreciate your kind attention. Don't leave us yet. We still got less, we have less than 30 minutes, so we're going to come back and do some more studying of the Word of God and seeking the Scripture way. We will be right back. Hi, I'm Rhonda. I'm a member of the Seminole Point Church of Christ in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. The Seminole Point Church of Christ has outstanding Bible classes for all ages. We have teachers who are dedicated to teaching God's Word in insightful and energetic ways. Please come visit us and bring your children. They will love our Bible classes and you will be benefited. Hello, my name is Dale Decker. I am one of four elders here at Seminole Point Church of Christ. We are very fortunate to have a Bible-loving group of Christians here at Seminole. We have seven deacons that work very hard in making sure that those things that are not directly related with the teaching and preaching of God's Word are done. Our Bible class teachers are second to none. We have Bible classes for all age groups. Our goal is heaven, and we make every effort to ensure that the Word of God is taught at every age group. We hope that you will come and check us out. You will find that we are a very friendly and loving congregation. We are located at 16,300 May Avenue in Oklahoma City. And now back to our study. You know, there's certain things that you do not get to hear during the course of our breaks here. We're having a discussion about what we're going to be looking at here in a minute. And Travis says, all right, we've got about 10 seconds. And we continue to talk. He says, we've got to go back. So, <laughs> so we came back. We came back. <laughs> just for you. <laughs> well, let's, 
let's go ahead, and, and I think, and Rosalita, you can always correct me if you're wrong on this. The, 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 the question, if I'm wrong on this, sorry. <laughs> I think what Rosalita was asking us is the is has to do with the the idea of the Holy Spirit. Um, Bible talks about the Holy Spirit being in us, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, but it's through the Word. Okay, and I really think it is kind of the idea of fellowship. All right, is it possible for the Holy Spirit, therefore, to lead to 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 no longer dwell with us? Okay, to to no longer have that relationship with us, if you would. And I would say, if I understand it, I would say, yeah or yes, to be more proper. Um, and I say that because of 1 John chapter 1, beginning there in verse 5, he talks about if, if an individual says he has fellowship with God and walks in darkness, he lies, and the truth is not in him. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship one with another, and Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sins. If I choose to walk a life of sin and I don't repent, I'm no longer in fellowship with God and with Christ and with the Holy Spirit. And I cannot say that I'm in fellowship with God. I cannot say I'm in fellowship with Christ. I cannot say that I'm in fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Nor could I say God dwells within me, Christ dwells within me, the Holy Spirit dwells within me, because they do not at that point when I choose to walk contrary to his will. Now, if I repent and come back and I'm restored to God's fellowship, we'll make 1 John 1, verse 5 and following there, if I repent and he forgives me, then I'm restored to fellowship with him. I'm restored to fellowship with Christ. I'm restored to fellowship with the Holy Spirit. I now dwell in the Holy Spirit, dwell in Christ, dwell in God, and they dwell within me. So I think, yes, sin will sever that relationship if we don't repent and ask God to forgive us. If I understood your question, your statement right. You know, we looked at uh, Romans 8 earlier uh, in verse uh, 14, where it says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. Yes. Yeah. So again, if you're going to be a child of God, if you're going to have this relationship with God, it necessitates that you are one who's willing to be led by the word that he has given us. That's right. And, and, and if you stop following that word, then you leave that, that fellowship right. relationship. Yeah. And so, so in that sense, it's not so much... Just like it's not God leaving us when we sin, it's us leaving God. The same, really the same is true here. It's not necessarily yes. the Holy Spirit leaving us. It's us separating ourselves from the Holy Spirit. I would think so. Dale, any thoughts? Well, I agree with what you're saying. I think this is a, a classic example where we have to be careful about taking one scripture and, and looking at that. Because when you look at the whole subject of what the Apostle Paul is talking about here. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, in, in verse 16, he says, Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. The idea of verses 12 through 20 is talking about glorifying God in body and spirit. True. And, and as we've discussed already, uh, the Holy Spirit dwells in us through the Word. Uh, when we looked at what the Apostle Paul was saying to the church at Ephesus, talking about the 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 uh, sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and just as as both of you mentioned, God doesn't leave us. Uh, the word doesn't leave us. We leave the word. The word's yeah. always there. Uh, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. Uh, the uh, John, uh, John one, John yeah. one, and uh, his account of the gospel. And the idea is that. Any any movement, any way, it's always the human flesh that does the movement. God desires that all men be saved, and and so uh, anyone who is not saved is because the individual chose not to be saved. That's true. That's true. And David makes a pretty good point, goes along with that. David from Alaska, uh, he says, when we shut ourselves off from the Spirit-given Word, as we were talking about here, we're shutting ourselves off. Right. Uh, then we quench the Spirit's power and influence in our lives. We stop its ability to have an impact on us if we're not willing to follow it and to look at it and to reflect upon it. Absolutely, absolutely. David, welcome to the study again. We have him and we have Rosalita from the Philippines and Kevin Kelly from Hot Springs, Arkansas and Anthony from the Columbia, Tennessee area and I think uh, Rod is up in Ohio, and so we've just got so many folks. <laughs> and if we appreciate you, you being with us here tonight. That's good, good, but I can't help but wonder just how cold is it up there in Alaska right now? Um, colder than it is here, I suspect. <laughs> now, so here's what we're looking at so far. We've asked the question, how would you identify or to what would you compare Christianity? And what we've done, we've talked about Paul comparing the Christian life to an athletic contest. 
and we showed that Paul often compared the Christian life to warfare, and Christians therefore then are compared to soldiers. But now let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12, and consider here that the Apostle Paul told Timothy to, here's what he said, fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession of the presence or in the presence of many witnesses. Now, Dale, wouldn't you say that the, the fight, the good fight of faith, is a noble conflict in the cause of religion? Well, absolutely. Yeah. And then you've got the laying hold, he says, on eternal life. What, yeah. is, what is that? Well, as the crown of victory uh, that is held out to us, uh, we are told to seize this as eagerly as the competitors at the Grecian Games laid hold on the prize. Okay. Uh, this is why Paul said, uh, strive for the, uh, uh, the prize. And, and then he goes on to talk about the fact <clears throat> here to which you are also called. That is, by the Spirit of God, that by the very nature of your profession, God does not call his people that they may become rich. Okay. He does not convert them in order that they may devote themselves to the business of gain. Christians are called for one reason and one only, and that's to a higher and nobler work. And that's what the Apostle Paul is telling Timothy here. This is a command. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called, and have confessed the good confession mm -hmm. in the presence of many witnesses. So you look at that, and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. What does that mean? Well, when we look at that, that is essentially to say that when he embraced, if you would, the, the Christian religion and made a public profession of it in the presence of the local congregation there, um, one of the best ways of stimulating ourselves or others to the faithful performance of duty is the remembrance of the vows that we made, in effect, when we became a child of God. And an individual needs to, to remember these the, the, the promise, the, the, the confession of their faith when they face those instances of, in life where the temptation is to backslide, the temptation is to draw away from the Lord. You know, and what is interesting is, is the Bible doesn't tell us very specifically to, to stand the person up in front of the congregation and say, do you believe? You know, in, in the case in point uh, of the Ethiopian eunuch, you know, Philip was answering his question when he says, well, if you believe, you may. And he says, I believe that Christ is the Son of God. But I do think, though, that as an individual who is about to baptize someone, I better ask them whether or not they believe before I ask them. Get them to make that outward statement of confession. That way, everybody who's around clearly knows that they believe. But also, it is, it is for them to state in an outward faction, a fashion um, their belief in Jesus and, and therefore to be unashamed of that. And, and I, I think that should help to solidify or as an anchor to keep an individual faithful to God. Yeah, I like, when I look at verses like this, especially when we consider <clears throat> who's, who Paul is writing to, he's not writing to uh, an individual who, who is new in the faith. He's not writing to an individual who is just converted or hasn't been converted yet. Right. You know, he's writing to someone who's fairly established in the faith and, and in the truth. And then, but yet he still uses the strong, the strong language and very active language. You know, fight the good fight. Lay hold of. I mean, That's right. That takes some work. He's saying, you know, you've confessed, now continue to fight, continue to lay hold of. And we need to continue to remember that when we're baptized and when we confess the name of Jesus, as you've said already that that mm -hmm. tonight and many times, that that's not the end. Right. Well, we still have a lot of battle to battle. We still have a lot of fight that we need to fight. And if we're not willing to do that, it's going to be a sad state in the end. Absolutely. We have to continue confessing. Mm -hmm. It's not a one-time right. you know, statement. You have to continue all that. I think it's a very, very good point. Well, Dale, why don't we go ahead and squeeze our last break in, and then we'll step into the next point of our study tonight. Okay. And um, on the other side of the break, we're going to consider the conclusion to the saints in Ephesus there, what Paul is saying there. And so stay tuned. We're about to pull up our minute message for the week. 
Are you amazed is what we're going to be looking at. So stay tuned. And on the other side of that, we will continue with our study. We will be right back. Are you still amazed? The Gospel of Mark records Jesus rebuking an unclean spirit, saying to the spirit, Be quiet and come out of him. When the crowd saw what Jesus had done, they were amazed. Mark chapter 1, verse 27 reads, Then they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. If you are a Christian, then think back to when you obeyed the gospel's call to salvation. Were you amazed when you learned of Jesus Christ, the price he paid for your sins, and God's willingness to forgive you of your past sins? Were you amazed to learn that God would remove all your previous guilt of sin? I suspect that your amazement was instrumental in your decision to obey the gospel's call to salvation. However, what about today? Do you still stand in amazement of our Lord and Savior? When you read of the many miracles which Jesus performed, are you still amazed? When you read of God's might and power, His creation of the universe and the wonder of His love, do you stand amazed? I would like to encourage all Christians to continue studying God's wonderful Word and continue being amazed at all the glory and marvelous works of God, Jesus Christ, and of the Holy Spirit. One day, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. Let us not wait until that moment to be amazed. Let us all live in amazement and direct our lives in faithful obedience to our amazing Heavenly Father. Now, let us return to our study of the scriptural way. John, any comments in the chat room? Oh, we have a couple. All right. Um, based on some of that last uh, discussion we had, uh, Rosalito mentions that uh, we need to fight, quotation, work, okay. uh, not faith only, as he points out in James 2.24, where he says, you see then that man is justified by works and not by faith only. Only, that's right. So again, and that's, that's kind of where I was leaning to us. I appreciate Brother Rosalito pointing out, was, there's a lot of activity involved here, and, and, and so many people say, well, there's no work, you know, you can't, there's no right. work involved in salvation. Well, it, there is in getting it, and there is in keeping it, and, even, and we see that very clearly. Even belief is the work of God. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Well, the Apostle Paul would not have told Timothy to fight the good fight if there wasn't work involved. Right. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. And then uh, Brother Davis said when first century Christians made that good confession, they literally laid their lives on the line by making such an open and public confession of faith in the resurrected Christ. That's a good point. Yep. That's a very good point. It, you know, to me, another terminology that we could use as instead of or with, along with confession, is not being ashamed of. You know, whatever actions, whatever statements, whatever we do or say, let it never reflect a sense of us being ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Because yep. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of it. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. when you get right down to it, there's two ways of confessing God. First is verbally. Right. Secondly is by our actions. Absolutely. That's absolutely right there. Well, let's consider the conclusion to, to the uh, letter to the church in Ephesus there, Dale. Well, <laughs> Ephesians reveals the great purpose of God for the church. If you go earlier in, in the book of, or letter to the Ephesians, uh, Ephesians, the third chapter, verses 10 11, says, To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. When you think of this passage, the meaning of it here is that God had formed a plan which was eternal in reference to the salvation of men, and that that plan had reference to the Lord Jesus, and that it was now ex executed by the gospel. Uh, it is impossible to get away from the idea that God has a plan. It is too often affirmed in the scriptures, and it is too consonant with our reason to be disputed. It is as undesirable as it is impossible to escape from that idea. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. Who could respect or honor an intelligent being that had no plan or had no purpose or, or no intention and, and that did all things by caprice or haphazard? 
Uh, if God has any plan, it must be eternal, and he has no new schemes. He has no intentions which he did not always have from the very beginning. Well, you know, he says in the text there, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished, eternal purpose which he made. Exactly right. You know, so that, that leaves no room for change, no rooms for updates. You know, it's, it's like applications on your phones or programs on your computers. One of the exciting things is look for updates, you know. Sometimes the updates don't work so well, and they've got to come up with an update to the update <coughs> to fix the problem of the update. But with the Word of God, there are no need for updates. It's according to the eternal purpose of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Yeah, yeah. which obviously <coughs> he's referring to Jesus, or which were to be executed, executed through Jesus is what he's saying. Yeah. Uh, the eternal plan had respect to Jesus and was to be executed by his coming and by his work. That's true. That's true. Well, what we find is as we look at this, the Apostle Paul, when he closed his letter to the church in Ephesus, the Ephesian letter there, he basically says to them, you are in a battle against evil. He wanted them to know that. And that's the, the message here that we see within this context here. And those who are blessed by God's purpose are still in a battle this very day. That's right. Uh, for that reason, we must put on the armor of God, as Paul told the church at Ephesus. We must always remember that God has provided this armor for a specific purpose, and that is to fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called, and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses, going back to 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12 that we read earlier. That's right. Telling them to fight the good fight of faith, to to agonize the good agony, if you would. You know, we, we have a contest to, to sustain in which our honor, our life, and our souls here are at stake. So we have to live the gospel, and we have to defend the cause of God. Unmark hypocrites. We have to purge and build up the church, live in the spirit of, of religion, and give ourselves wholly to the work of God. And to essentially lay hold on that eternal life. That's correct. And all this is in allusion to the exercises in the public Grecian games. Yeah, Fight, that's true. conquer, and seize upon the prize. Carry out the crown of eternal life. To which you were also called, Paul says to Timothy. Timothy's faith was, faith was undoubtedly tried by severe persecution. Yeah. Uh, as our faith is oftentimes tried today. Uh, maybe not by as severe persecution as, as Timothy, and, and certainly not by the Apostle Paul, but our faith is tried every day of our lives by our friends, our family members, uh, and our co-workers. Yeah. And we need to fight the good fight of faith. That's absolutely certain. Yeah, it's good to, you know, we see here the good fight, and this would be the only fight that I think we can honestly say is without a doubt always good. Yeah. There's a lot of battles that men engage in. There's a lot of fights that we end up in uh, in this carnal world, and whether they're good or not sometimes can be significantly debated. <laughs> and depending on how you look at it, m most of the time not as good as you would want them to be. Yeah. Uh, but this fight, this, this spiritual fight that we're talking about here for our souls, is always good to fight. There's never a time where if we're fighting this fight that we can't say we're, we are doing a good thing. Right. That's right. You know, I mentioned that uh, Timothy's uh, faith was undoubtedly tried by severe persecution. The one example we have that might suggest that would be Hebrews, the 13th chapter, in verse 23, when it said, Know that our yeah. brother Timothy has been set free, with whom I shall see you if he comes shortly. It appears from this verse that uh, Timothy was imprisoned for the testimony of Christ, and perhaps it was then more than at his ordination that he made the good confession here mentioned. He risked his life and conquered. Uh, if not a mortar, he was a confessor. I, yes, I thought this is an interesting point about that, Hebrews 13, 23, and the implication that, that Timothy was in chains or had been bound up in chains. Well, one of the, the things that we realize as we sit and we study through this is that basically Paul, he's going to put, he put all things, he put things into perspective here. Think about this for a moment. Paul put some things in proper perspective in Ephesians there, in his letter to the church in Ephesus. And what he does, he brings to their attention and to our attention 
God's provision and we as Christians partaking of God's provision. He lays this all out for us nice and neat. You know, and he it, does. Yeah. But it's possible, isn't it, for people to have distorted this emphasis? Oh, absolutely. Well, we may go to the extreme of God's provision and think exclusively of God's part in our salvation. Yeah. Uh, the other extreme is a type of or religious humanistic approach whereby man becomes the measure of all things and saves himself by his own strength. Yeah. That's true. John? No, I mean, if we compare this just like to any physical battle as it was compared in this, in this time, if, you're, if your army that's providing your resources gives you the armor you need, um, and they lay it all out nice and neat for you, just like God has provided us the tools necessary for us to fight this good fight, uh, if they provide you those tools and you leave them sitting on the, on the bed when you go out to, to battle, they've done you no good. Right. Uh, but then again, if you, like Dale says, you know, if you put them on and you think because you put them on, it's all you, you know, you're the reason, is everything you, it's all you've done, that's the reason why you've conquered and survived this battle, then again, you're, you're mistaken. That's true. I think that's a very, very good point there. There's two, there's two roles, just, just like in that case. There's the one who provides, and mm -hmm. then there's one who, who accepts the provisions and uses them, not just uses them, but uses them properly. Well, you know, you, you think about even in the, um, even in the parable that, Jai, that, that Jesus talks about in regards to the parable of the, the wages, parable of the talents, with uh, one given five, one given two, and one given one. Now, of course, we know the talents, there were money and everything, but it's all about they used what they were given, and we use what we have been given, the provisions that we've been provided or which God has provided for us. Oh, you think about David. I mean, what yeah. did he have? I mean, he had just great faith. That, <clears throat> that was God that, that gave him this faith. That's right. You know, I mean, he had it, but God provided the ability to have this faith in him, and, and he was able to go conquer the giant with a stone and a, and a slingshot. Yeah. I mean, nobody would have really thought that plan out, but he <laughs> said, you know, because I'm using what God has given me to its full extent properly, I know that I can, I can, I can conquer this, this giant. That's right. Now, I think what's interesting, when you study the Bible, you'll find that what all cases of victory, every follower of God that succeeded within their life and in their service unto God, they all have one thing in common, and that's their faith. Mm -hmm. Not a mere acknowledgment, but a life-changing conviction and persuasion that there is only one way to go, one way to walk, one way to follow and that is to follow after the will of God. Yeah. And David pointed out something here as well, and I'm wondering, did he, did he start that before I mentioned? Maybe we were thinking right on the same path, but uh, he said David couldn't use Saul's armor. You know, it was, it, you know he w wasn't going to hold up under yes. Saul's yes. armor. Yes, right. <laughs> he says he had, he had God's armor instead. And then Kevin points out again, as you were just mentioned, faith is the victory. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll hold off stepping into our next section in this study. Um, and if you want to look ahead in your lessons, is section number four, each person has an evil day. We'll hold that off until next Tuesday night in our Bible study. You know, one thing I want to let you know, this is the last lesson as we mentioned earlier in our study of the armor of God. And we have something else on the horizon. We're going to start a study on the home, on the family. And I'm not certain yet how many lessons that is going to be. You know, and one thing, you know, John, I've never mentioned this. We need to tell these, the, our, our, our viewers something. And, Dale, I apologize. We never did this for you. But the one that has written both our previous study that we went through in regards to 1 Peter 4, 11 through, or 5 through 11, 2 Peter 1, 5 through 11, and our study of the armor of God, all this was put together by Dale. And actually, I can't take all the credit for it because I use information from a, several different uh, sources. He did, but it's a good, you, you did a good job putting it all together. Yeah. Um, so what we're going to be going into next is a study of the home. And so that may be two weeks from now. I'm not real certain. We'll see how time goes. And we had a request, and we're still weighing and, and discussing it. We, it, was, it was asked if we could consider doing a question and answer uh, broadcast. Where we, where you just give us your questions and and you help us with the answers. You know, if you have a question, we ask one thing. If if we were to do this, the the request would be 
help us answer some other questions. <laughs> Don't just give us one. But we're not certain yet. We're going to talk about it a little bit. I think it's a great idea, but we need to um, weigh a couple things with it and also make sure that we have that you have enough notice to get people to come in or else we'll pull out an outline and just, just tread through something. You know. But anyway, something to think about. We'll give some thoughts to that. All right. So, any other thoughts, John, from the chat room? Nothing here. Everybody's uh, just appreciating the study. We appreciate your being here and all the comments and questions that you put in this evening. Absolutely. Absolutely. Dale, any other thoughts? No thoughts at all, but I am certainly delighted that you are with us tonight. And uh, uh, I still can't help but wonder just how cold is it up there in Alaska? Someday he, I'm going he, to get he up there. He said it was cold. Yeah. He said it was all cold. All caps, too. So that, that's cold. All uh, caps. <laughs> Someday I'm going to get up there. That's right. And we'd like to thank Travis, as always, doing a fine job keeping everything rolling along smoothly and keeping us on track with our time. But most importantly, we'd like to thank you for your interest in spiritual matters. We'd like to thank you for joining us as we seek the scriptural way. When you go through your life this week, always remember to carry that armor of God with you. Never leave the home, never leave your home without it. Make sure you always wield that sword of the Spirit with, the, with the, 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 the care and precision that God expects of you. And remember, you can always, once you become a child of God, you can always serve the Lord and overcome sin and walk the path that leads to eternity with God in heaven. Keep on that straight and narrow. Thank you very much. And Lord willing, we'll see you back here again next Tuesday night at 730 Central Standard Time at scripturalway.org. Have a wonderful week.